So, Kellen, up to this point, we have covered 10 episodes uh, from an intro to some principles, why we need collapse. We've run through pretty much the entire framework, right? And today is the last episode of discussing the pieces of the framework one by one. So with everything that we've put together, I think it's been a, it's a great way to go from not being resilient, right, to becoming more resilient. And then you can recycle through those steps as many times as you want to become more resilient on a personal level. And we have talked about how a lot of parts of resilience, they are personal. You have to master things yourself in order to in order to be able to help other people. And the purpose of today's episode, uh, the last piece of the framework, is that you have to make resilience about more than just yourself. And even though we're this far into the podcast, it still feels like we're at the very beginning. It's still just the introduction. And community is something that we've talked about here and there, but I'm excited to dive further into it because we've hyped it up as like, this is one of our big differentiators. Like we care so much about community and having a resilient community is so important to personal resilience. Um, but we've kind of just sprinkled it throughout so far. So to dive a little bit deeper now and to know that we will be able to get deeper on this topic again and again in the future is something that I think is really important for us. And I know it's, it's a big piece of what at least our listeners have mentioned wanting to hear about and talk about. What, what does it look like to build community, right? And we mentioned in uh, the introduction episode that there is a huge range of what that means to be in a resilient community or to create community, right? You might have at one extreme people who say the only way to do this is to build like an intentional community where you and a group of people go out and, and you, you build from scratch something new, right? And there will be other people that will be like, intentional communities will never work, and here's why. And so everyone's in a in a spectrum. Everyone lies somewhere as far as what they're willing to do, what they're able to do, as far as community goes. And we just want to make sure that people know we're taking a balanced approach to this. We will talk about intentional communities, right? I think the majority of the focus is going to be on the average person and what they can do to build a stronger community where they are. For sure, there are pros and cons to different situations you find yourself in, different community types, whether you're urban or suburban or rural or anything in between. There are are so many variables, again, that go into what makes a a community resilient. But the important part is, you know, most people feel like they're not going to make a huge life change. And so we don't want to sort of push that idea that that you have to, that you have to have um, a million dollars to go buy a thousand acres of land to start a community. The idea of community is interesting, I think, because um, in a lot of traditional prepping communities, it's it's not talked about. And which is funny because I just said prepping communities, right? They're forums online or groups of people who talk about prepping, but the vibe is still pretty isolationist. It's still pretty personal. There's a lot of trust issues. People don't want to like give up information about themselves to each other in case someone they think that person's going to come take everything from them. And and we don't. That's that's not the that's not what we're going for, right? And there are some very specific reasons for that that we're going to go over today. Why why community is so important? But I think one of the the main ones to just that that we should always have in mind is the fact that we evolved in communities we we evolved as humans to be around other people to be social creatures this is not something new this isn't even something with like modern society there's evidence that 2 million years ago uh whatever version of humans we were that long ago we were socializing as as recent as 130,000 years ago we were trading things over long distances in order to be able to share resources. There are lots of different reasons why communities make people stronger and why they made people stronger um, that long ago. And so um, whether it's a utility purpose, right, something really logical, or whether it's the, the fact that they've even, there's research that says that humans are innately compassionate. And that is evolutionary as well, because you're more likely to find a mate if uh, 
if it shows that you're going to take care of them and take care of their offspring and care for them. Um, and so we've, we've evolved to care for each other. And while a lot of people in today's society, especially with, with capitalism, I think capitalism has taken and reversed that. It's almost like we're devolving into becoming more isolationist instead of uh, giving to and growing together as a community. Capitalism drives us to take from community. It drives us to separate ourselves and take advantage of what's already there. And so um, it's good to know that we can rely on our evolutionary strengths to find community. And it's not something that should feel completely unnatural to us. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that whether it's like you call it groups or clans or tribes, villages, whatever, humans are innately social creatures. That is how we thrive. And our modern society has done something really interesting because in some ways we're more connected than ever before. Like we're we're globalized. We can talk to people on the other side of the planet and yet people feel more isolated than ever before. And it it's not really our natural state. It's not where we thrive. To me, it's interesting that even most mammals, um, you know, are in herds or packs or troops or, you know, whatever the term is for their species. Right. It's the natural order of things. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people are like, well, I'm a, I'm a lone wolf, which is funny because wolves go in packs. Right. Um, you know, there's some, it's like male polar bears and, you know, there's some mammals that will live their lives mostly in isolation, but, and, and that may be the case that for some people sure, that that's better for them, but it's just going to be very few and far between. It's not the default. The default is that we are social creatures. And if you consider yourself like an anti-social person or an introvert, it doesn't mean that you don't thrive better in a community. It just means that there's some adapting to be able to, to outwardly express that and to, to gain those skills to make it happen. But I think that that introversion comes from the maladies of society today, the way we've taken community and we've morphed it and made it something kind of ugly. And I think a lot of introverts, they see that and they don't want to be a part of it. It's not that they don't necessarily like other people that they aren't compassionate that they don't that they wouldn't thrive well in the right type of community i i do personally believe that it's just because of the way society is so it's going to be about finding and creating the right types of community in the right ways um, to really be able to thrive yeah and i'm glad you call that out because i'm somebody who every every time i've ever taken like a personality test it always shows up that i'm more introverted than extroverted um, but when people think about community and the importance of it, they might think, oh, I'm an introvert because I don't like to go to parties or because I'd rather like do a, a personal hobby on my own than sit there and have a conversation one on one with somebody. That doesn't mean that there aren't aspects of community that you need in order to be more resilient. And I think that brings up a good point that, that there's a lot of different ideas about what community is, right? You can Google definition of community and you'll find like five different um, definitions of community. We can look at community from all sorts of different aspects. Um, and and really, everyone's going to have a different way of viewing it. And we're probably going to have a different way of viewing it than other people. But Kellen, to you, what is community in the way that we're talking about it? Yeah, so community is that, that word is used in so many different ways. Um, it can just be people living in the same place. Sure. Right? That like, this little geographically yeah this is a community it can be a group of people that have something in common like you might say the scientific community you might even say the collapse community or the resilience community right um it can be people that you feel some sort of like bond or fellowship with it can be you know we talked about you mentioned intentional communities in the context of preparedness and resilience which you mentioned we're not going to dive super deep into that, but there will be a place for that in what we're talking about. And by the way, there are so many fascinating things there. Like there's different group dynamic theories. There's models for 
how to build an intentional community. There's even a foundation for intentional community that uh, one of our patrons mentioned to us. There, there are so many cool things that we are researching. But when we talk about community, I like thinking about it in this way. Um, you may have heard the phrase, this is often used in like the business world, this idea that your network is your net worth. And it's kind of a dumb phrase, honestly. Um, there's flaws to it, but it has some validity, right? Oh, another phrase you might hear is like, you are the, the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Just this idea that who you are around the most contributes to like who you are as a person. Um, so to summarize our stance on it, it's basically the more resilient the people around you are, the more resilient you will be personally. And when I say the people around you, that doesn't just mean like proximity or, or you know, geographically. It's like the people that you associate with or that you are connected to. The more resilient your network of people, the more resilient you will be. So we'll, t we'll dive into it in depth, but like there are aspects of community that are your friends and family and those that are close to you. There are aspects of community that involve though, you know, your network online or the forums that you are a part of. Um, all of that will come into play, but context matters in those situations. So does that help clarify? Do you think? Yeah, totally. I, that's a great way to look at it. Um, we may refer to community in other ways, right? We might talk about your local community and we might talk about the strengths, uh, you know, how you can strengthen your local community as a whole, meaning everybody in your geographical area. And we're going to use it in different ways, but it's good to know the way you just described sort of the core of community and, uh, and how we'll use that primarily going forward. Yeah. And when I say that, the more resilient the people around you are, the more resilient you will be. You might hear that and think like, well, no, nah, that's not really true. But let me just give a few examples. Yeah. So if you have family and friends with a lot of money, then you are more likely to be okay when you get hit hard financially. Like that's just logic. Uh, and And you can see that all over the place that if somebody loses their job, but their family and friends can help jump in and support them financially like they're going to be better off right i mean even if it's like hey we don't have money for you but we've got a spare bedroom that you can come live in you know if everyone around you is destitute and impoverished and you lose your job you are not going to have those options to you that you would if everyone around you is that's not to say that everyone's gonna like pick you up and and pay for your lifestyle and keep you going but you have more options and you are more shielded for sure yeah so another example, um, the stronger your social connections, the more of a support group you will have when you experience like a mental health crisis. It's just, it's just how it works. If all of a sudden you get hit with anxiety or depression or whatever it is, and, and you don't have any like strong social connections, you are going to be a lot worse off than if you've got all these people around you that can rally together and support you. The more people around you that have a way to heat their home when the power goes out, the more likely you'll be okay when the power goes out in the wintertime. Like it, it's just, I don't know that there's a whole lot to elaborate on there because it's just straightforward, right? It, whether it's that in that case, it's like the people on your street, right? That if, if they have a way to heat their homes, you're going to be, you're more likely to be okay. But in the case of like mental health, it might be that your support network lives all around the world, but those are the people that you interact with the most. And so that's a different form of community that will help you in that instance. Yeah. Well said. Um, I think of, you know, when we're talking more about like societal collapse, you have to consider that, look, we're, we're a global community right now. All 8 billion of us on the planet are considered a community, right? Our community is not going to survive. That's the whole idea of collapse is that this community that we have, this global network of people um, that all relies on each other uh, in all the myriad ways that we do, that's going to break down and 
it's going to come down to the other types of communities that we've built to strengthen us. So yes, a piece of that is our local community. Um, a piece of that is our network. A piece of that is our close family and friends. Uh, a piece of that is going to be the people on our street. And, you know, I think about um, while you're talking about examples, it, every person on your street or on your uh, in your apartment block or whatever that it, that you can trust, every person that is on the same page as you, that you've built a relationship with, that is not only uh, one more person you can rely on, but one less person you have to be afraid of. If you are on your own, if you're living this sort of prepper fantasy of like um, isolationism and bunker or whatever, you, you literally, you've made every single person potentially your enemy in your mind, right? Um, and it's you against the other 8 billion and and especially those close to you. Uh, but if, if you can flip that and you can make those people if you can trust them, make them your friends, right? If you can care for them as well, um, suddenly you have a, a group of people who are tight together and you're further insulated. Every uh, every rung of the circle we've talked about, it's kind of a target, right? As it goes out wider and wider. As you expand your circle of influence, you're you're making yourself safer in the center. You're insulating yourself from the effects uh, as things get harder through collapse on the outside. Yeah. And it's interesting when we phrase it that way, kind of your circle of influence, you know, if our global community was super resilient, that'd be ideal. Right. We we would all be 100% insulated if we were living completely sustainable. Right. Or if even your country was super resilient or your your state or region or province or your town, right? And you get all the way down to a micro level and yeah, the the more you can expand out in that target and expand how much resilience is around you, the better off you're going to be. So really community, going back to just how we define it, community is a collection of relationships. Like that's how we're seeing it. And there are three types of relationships that we think are worth considering here. So the first is a relationship in which resilience is the primary focus. So, you know, that might be like, if you're talking about an intentional community, that might be you're gathering people that like really the whole reason you even have a relationship with them is because you're focusing together on resilience. Or it might be like you've found somebody that you are hiring to like come help you dig a well and teach you how to, you know, how to maintain that, that person, your whole relationship with them re revolves around you being more resilient. One aspect to that in that kind of a relationship is that if your commitment to that shared goal of building resilience dips, or if, if their commitment dips, then the relationship will suffer. Uh, but there's a second type of relationship with community in which resilience is just a secondary focus. So it it might be an openly acknowledged goal, but it's not the reason for the relationship. So that would be you and I. Right. Like we have been friends almost our entire lives. And like we've decided together that we want to be more resilient. But that's not the reason that we have a relationship or I think about my, my wife and I like, obviously our relationship exists because I love her and she loves me and we love spending time together and we're building this life together. And it's like this secondary goal that somewhere along the way we've decided, Oh, we also want to help each other become more resilient. So a third type of relationship that is worth considering here is a relationship in which resilience is an unacknowledged side effect. So this will probably be the case with most of the people in your life. Your neighbor that you're building a relationship with, you're not like you're probably not building the relationship with you both acknowledging that the purpose of that relationship is to be more resilient. You're just becoming friends, getting to know each other, you're here for each other to some degree. 
And you might know that having that relationship helps you be more resilient, but it it may not be the primary purpose or even the secondary purpose or the tertiary. It's a byproduct of the relationship. Yeah, that's exactly it. So these these types of relationships um, will become more important as we dive further into like our philosophy and our model around building community. Awesome. Is there, uh, in, in your mind, going through those, is there one of those that is optimal? Ye- <laughs> no. <laughs> I was going to say yes. Yes, for each situation. Uh, no across the board. So I, it'll be fun when we get into some examples, but that's a really good question. It's not like we're aspiring to have everybody we know be in that first category right? or in the second category or the third. It's good to have the right mix, um, and that will just happen naturally anyways. Cool. So as you are building relationships, uh, whether somebody falls into that first category or the second or the third, in some cases you'll recognize you need quantity in some cases you'll recognize you need quality or you might see that as like breadth versus depth so uh you know i might feel like i need for for certain reasons to build a broader network of just being connected to more people but i don't necessarily need to build a deeper relationship with all those people in other cases I do need to build a deeper relationship with people. So that's where a model comes in that is, I think, so useful. Uh, My wife, her master's degree is in an area of social sciences that has to deal with relationships and relationship building. And um, there's a model, it's called the RAM model. It's mostly for like healthy dating relationships. Uh, But it, it, is relevant to relationships across the board. So there are five aspects for, for our purposes. We'll only focus on four, but in like a dating relationship, the whole idea is that there's a, a certain order to these aspects to know somebody, to trust someone, to rely, to commit, and then like physical affection or touch. And the whole idea is that, each aspect should only be as high as the previous aspect in a healthy relationship. So you shouldn't trust somebody more than you know them. You shouldn't rely on somebody more than you trust them. You shouldn't commit to a higher degree than you rely on somebody. And it's funny because my wife used to teach these relationship classes. Oftentimes she would go into high schools or into prisons and teach like how to have these healthy relationships. and people would recognize how unhealthy their relationships were. She'd use this example of like Disney princesses and they'd step through and say like, is this relationship healthy? And in almost all cases with Disney princesses, they are committing at a really high level before they know somebody hardly at all. Right? And, and so anytime these are off balance and you're not seeing it um, sequential, in that order, uh, that's when you start to get in trouble. So now that we need to get into dating <laughs> and, and that side of relationships, when are we gonna uh, when are we gonna roll out the resilience dating app? <laughs> Find <laughs> your mate in the apocalypse, sort of thing. I, it might do really well. I think it would. I, you know, at least among our le- listener base. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the whole idea here is like. If there is somebody that you know you need to rely on to some degree, you, you've you got to put some of those preliminary steps in first. I don't want to just pull some random person off the street and have to like completely rely on them for my own resilience. And so first, I want to know enough about them and get to know them to a degree that I can actually trust them. When I have that trust, that's when I can build some reliance there, mutual reliance. And, and, you know, that might pave the way to have a certain degree of commitment to like, Hey, if this happens, I'm going to help you here, if, you know, and, and you'll help me in this way. So uh, just a super important way to look at it as you're looking at people around you that you need to strengthen your relationship with. 
you know, something you said uh, just struck me because you mentioned that, like, you don't want to pull somebody off the street and have to rely on them for your well-being or your survival. And the truth is, we all, like, it, the way that society is built right now, our, our our societal relationship is unhealthy because we do rely on society as a whole and as and on thousands of strangers to do their part in order for us to survive. We've talked about supply chains and what it takes to get our food on the table and uh, get the water, you know, to come out the tap and all of just the hundreds of steps and processes in between and all of the people involved in that. And, and that's what's so dangerous about society is that if that falls apart, our ability to, to continue living does as well. And so it's kind of being able to run through those steps that you just mentioned and relate those to the relationships that do or that could allow us to survive if the system fails. Um, so, yeah, I, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and this will become even more important as we step a little bit further. So I want to introduce a little bit of like imagery to to help us conceptualize all of this. There are, you know, there are certain types of trees that can stand alone and be very resilient. Um, and oftentimes those trees, their roots will go down like two to three times deeper than the height of the tree. But um, there's there's some downsides to that as well. Really resilient trees often grow together in such a way that their roots are actually like intertwined or or interconnected. That way, when strong winds come in, they're not just trying to hold themselves up. They're all holding each other up. So I want you to just imagine for a moment <laughs> that you are a tree in a forest. Okay. And I want you to just think like, who are the trees around you that would need your strength if strong winds came through? So I'd love to hear what you, you think personally, Corey. I know for me, like, my children depend on me. That's the first, yeah, the first thought that comes to mind. Like my wife, my kids, like they they would definitely need uh, to rely on my strength to withstand those winds. Others, maybe to a lesser degree, that come to mind for you. Yeah, extended family, parents and siblings, um, friend groups, maybe even some like work relationships where they don't necessarily rely on me for that, but I. I could strengthen them and I could be strengthened by them. Good. Good. So then uh, who are the trees that you would need to rely on? Yeah. So when I think about what, what, what or who I rely on, it's, it kind of goes back to what I had just mentioned. It's a bunch of people I don't know. Right. Um, obviously in a more immediate impact would be like the people who are in charge of me at work and have the ability to fire me. Right. They're in, they are, they run my financial success. Um, so they have my lives in their hands that way. But yeah, it extends out from there to the people that transport my food and uh, the people who build the roads and the government who makes the laws. So m maybe that's not as specific as you would like as far as like individual people. But uh, I feel like I rely on a, quite a large forest to keep me going. Yeah, and I think currently we all do. And that's why so often you see these communities or these these individuals who will want to separate themselves from the system because they don't want to have to rely on it. They want to be independent from it because they don't trust the system. They can see that there are cracks or faults and they don't want like, you know, to be in a situation where one person on the other side of the world who's ultra wealthy, who makes a certain decision in their life, that's going to have all these impacts that is suddenly going to, you know, put them in a destitute situation. So if you think about yourself kind of in a forest, you're one of these trees, uh, you only have so much bandwidth to be able to extend out your roots. And like, let's say you can only produce a pound of roots a day. Are you going to grow like thicker, stronger roots toward those closest to you? Are you going to spread, you know, thousands of like hair width roots to those that you, you might not be as closely associated with? So anyways, as you start to think about that, 
And that's where we now get to go back to all the steps we've done so far and look at our threat modeling, our, our risk analysis, and say, what are the top threats? Um, and then ask ourselves a couple of questions. So first of all, like for threat A, which trees would I rely on most for help? And maybe we'll go through this as an example. So let's say one of my, I'll give a couple of threats that might be an example. My job is not very secure. I recognize a threat is that I could lose my job. Let's say an, another one of my top threats is that I'm prone to depression. And another one of my top threats is that I live in an area like an earthquake zone. I'm likely to get hit by an earthquake. So first question for, for each of those risks is which trees would I rely on most for help? Well, if my job isn't very secure, honestly, it's probably not my close family and friends that are going to be able to help me out if I lose my job. For me, I probably need to expand my larger network and and make some more efforts like on LinkedIn or elsewhere where if if all of a sudden I need to find a new job, I've got a bunch of connections. So that's where I'm going to be spreading out like lots of smaller routes to a broader range of people. And in the meantime, you need to make sure that those shorter, thicker routes are in place for your family and friends because if you do end up on a couch somewhere, right, or you need, you know, if if you need to help with the, this month's mortgage or something, um, that you have really close friends that you can trust and rely for that type of help as well. Yeah, well said. Um, let's say for my, my second um, risk that I mentioned, I'm prone to depression. Well... Which trees am I going to rely on most for help in that situation? Probably for me, my closest friends. And that's where, like, if I want to be resilient, I need to be strengthening those roots. I need to be building those relationships at a deeper level. In that case, it's probably not like my really broad network that I need to put a lot of attention toward. I live in an earthquake zone. Well, is it is it my family you know, that, that spread across the country that's going to be able to help me a whole lot when an earthquake hits? Probably not in the short term. Um, that's one where I might say I need to strengthen my roots with those that live on the same street as me. If one of my kids, I can't find them, they were off playing in the neighborhood, like I need to know my neighbors well enough. They need to know who my kids are so that I can grab one of my neighbors and have them help me search the neighborhood. To... Or or at least be able to just ask me, have you seen so-and-so? And they know who you're talking about and what they look like. And Exactly. Yeah. So that's where you get st you start to get be a little bit strategic with, here are my risks. Here are the relationships that I need to be prepared with from a community standpoint to be able to counteract those risks. So that first question, which trees would I rely on most for help? And then... The second question is, are my roots adequately connected to that tree or that group of trees? And to help you really identify that, um, that's where you can say, do I need that person to be a one, two, or a three? You know, if you remember what we talked about a few minutes ago, do I need that person to be somebody who our relationship is solely focused around resilience? Or is it somebody that I just need to know we've got a relationship, it's not focused on resilience, um, they don't even know that it's going to really strengthen my resilience, but at least I know that. Or is it kind of in between where it's somebody that I have this strong relationship with and we know that really resilience is a goal, but it's not our primary focus. And then the next question you'd want to ask yourself is, would they be surprised or unwilling to help? in the scenario that that risk plays out. And, and and that's that third question is obviously really important. The amount of help that you're asking for is going to influence how much uh, you need, how far you need to be on that ladder that we talked about earlier of between knowing them, uh, trusting them, relying on them, committing to them. If it's a, if it's an easy ask, right? Have you seen my kid in the neighborhood? I can't find him after this earthquake. Have you seen him? That's, that's pretty low on the ladder. No, 
maybe a little bit of trust. But if it's, um, hey, I can't pay my mortgage this month. <laughs> Can you help me out? I'll pay you back, I promise. Right? That's taking now some some trust and some reliance. That relationship has to be deeper and uh, and it takes work to get there. Yeah. And I, I love thinking about all the different scenarios that come to mind, all these different risks that could uh, be a factor. You know, so there might be like a medical problem that I have or that somebody in my close family has. And as I think about that risk and I think about my community, I can identify, okay, here's here's the one person who is a doctor that I know that that's who I want to be able to reach out to if we ever need help with this medical problem. I can then say, okay, is that person a one, two, or a three? Well, really, they're they're just a one because my relationship with them is just based about, around them being able to help me with that one aspect of resilience. And then have we at least established enough of a relationship or the right expectations to where if that medical crisis takes place, that they won't be surprised or unwilling to help when I reach out to them. And and so again, we can just go through this with each risk that we face. Um, and it's a really meaningful way to make sure we're deliberate about our relationships and building community across those different targets we've talked about. You know, and with all that, I think it's important, uh, super important to vocalize again, because we've talked about this before, but to, to make mention that the idea of building community, the idea of building relationships, it's not just a self-serving one, right? It's not, we've talked about it here, like, if I need help with something, who can I rely on? And then building the the relationships based on that. But it's a two-way street to say, those relationships that I'm building, I am also committing to help those people where I can. We can flip it and say, um, who are the people that rely on me or that could rely on me? And what assets do I have? And what relationships have I built that I can be helpful to others as well? It's never going to be healthy to try and build relationships based on selfish, like, it's just for me, 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 what what do I need to get out of it? The whole purpose of community and resilience is to strengthen each other and to build each other up. And anytime you build a relationship with anybody, it has to be based on the trust, right? Of saying, like, that expectation that I would receive help, I, I also am fully committing to give that help if needed, um, if I'm able yeah, in any relationship, it's a give and a take, and there's got to be that that balance. And I'm so glad you mentioned it because we're not just we don't want to see people around us as just like a means to an end. People aren't assets, right? And although there is some degree of strategy, like we don't want our relationships to all be transactional. We don't want to be thinking like, okay, I want to be resilient, so. I need a doctor and a dentist and a... <laughs> yeah, like I need a plumber and I, like in trying to check this list of now I've got my network of people, now I'm resilient. And, and since I already know this doctor, I don't need to get to know that doctor because I've already got one. Like that's not what we're aiming for here. Right. And and it's not like, okay, I'm going to go help my neighbor do this one thing. Now they owe me one. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now I know that they, they have to help me in this other situation. Right. Like there's just, we, we can be more organic about it. There's natural give and take. We try to build relationships and just be kind to people. Um, strategic in the sense of like making sure we're strengthening the relationships in a way that will set us up successfully, um, but not so strategic that we're living a, a, a mechanical life based on just are you part of my plan? Yes or no? Okay, then like take a hike or, or now now you can be on my good side. Yeah. And look, uh, this kind of goes back to the, the first part of the framework, which is establishing your desired outcome. For some people, there are people out there who are just extremely selfless, just extraordinarily compassionate. They live to help other people. And, uh, you know, in, in as we go through collapse, they will probably prioritize other people's well-being more than their own. And if that's what brings you joy and, you know, that's what your desire is, if that fulfills you as a person to just sacrifice for other people then like maybe you take that into account as you 
become resilient. Maybe your relationship building is is just entirely focused on how you can be of help to other people. And I think we should all aim for that, right? We should all aim to be thinking about how can we help the most people. It's cheesy and corny. If everybody did that, then the world would be a better place, right? If everybody just thought about other people. Um, but while we are, of course, going to be trying to build our own resilience, and that is important, we just can't forget that like, like we evolved to be compassionate and we can't ignore that. We need to lean into it and be thinking about how can we benefit the lives of other people. Yeah. And I think most people are good, like just good natured. You talked about how there are some mindsets around preparedness where people think like everyone's going to be against me and try to take my food. And like, there are so many examples of crises that have happened and you see the opposite where people really step up to the plate find ways to help each other out you don't want to just utterly rely on that but i like to think um that's going to be the case that that if there's like a disaster in your area you're going to see people helping each other out you're going to help them out but even if there's never a crisis like what could be a more fulfilling life than actually helping other people along the way goes back to your desired outcome, like you said, but I would hope that like, yeah, we're, we're not just seeing people as part of our plan. We we can be selfless and help each other, help other people, even at our own detriment where it makes sense. You know, I think of, uh, of my neighborhood and some of the people that I've grown up there with and that were examples and leaders to me. And that there are just people that stand out as being extremely selfless. And you just look at that person and you say, I know that they genuinely care about other people. And I also know that if if they were ever going through a hard time, people would people in the neighborhood would reach out and do whatever they could for them. Because that person has given so selflessly. They trust that person. They know that they're genuine and and it gets paid back, right? Even if that's not what the person was looking for. They weren't nice and genuine and, and helpful to other people thinking one day, like, this is going to come back to me and, and I'm going to, you know, get mine. But that's how it works out because people can sense that genuineness. You can't go into relationships um, transactionally because it will come off that way. And that you'll never get past the no, you're right, to trust and rely. You'll sit at no and people will wonder why you're kind of shady because because you're not you're not being genuine about your relationships. Yeah, so I on the one hand, like probably the most important thing with any aspect of resilience is just being intentional, being deliberate. That's why we've talked so much about having a plan. And so I, when it comes to relationships, we do need to be intentional in how we think about it. Um, but I just hope we can all walk that line, have the right balance of building relationships to help us be more resilient but building relationships anyways because we care about other people well Colin, i i'm really excited to talk about more uh, about community more because there are so many directions to take it there's so many niche things to talk about we'll talk about strategies for building those relationships uh we'll probably do episodes on going through each of those steps as far as getting to know people number one trust building trust with people the rely, the commit, all of that will break down much deeper. Um, you know, I think I've gone through some exercises myself to say, in my neighborhood, in my proximity geographically, who do I know, who do I trust, um, and who do I not know, and who do I not trust? And it was fascinating to me to go through that and, and realize, I think I knew something like, of my closest 300 neighbors, I knew 60% of them. And which is remarkable. Like, yeah, I would imagine almost anybody listening would say, man, I know <laughs> of my closest 300 neighbors, I know like four of them. Right. And that's because of some unique things with our geography and uh, the local communities and, and religion that, that affiliated with here. We just know a lot of people. Right. And I, I'll bet if you did that exercise, you'd be somewhere along those lines as well. Um, and but but like you said, that's above the average. I'm fairly certain. And we'll go over some of those exercises and how to do those and, and be strategic about realizing, okay, of my immediate however many neighbors, how many do I feel like I could rely on or trust or not trust and being strategic about how we can make those changes. So anyway, I just bring that up to say 
there's going to be a lot of looking into those types of things in the future. And I'm, I'm just really excited to dive in further on that. Um, in the immediate near term with our next episodes, um, in the spirit of staying organized, we talked about how we're going to go through this piece by piece and keep everything organized. From here, we're going to talk about those um, pillars, right? We went through briefly all the pillars. We're going to take them now episode by episode and go deeper to make sure that uh, you understand what each pillar is, get some ground level um, strategies in place for um, just beginning with each of them, some actionable items in order to get started and make sure that you've got some solid ground. And then we'll just keep going deeper and deeper from there. Looking forward to it. <laughs>